uh, but Professor Sharma, you do realize that transgenic is but a tertiary stage of crop breeding. I mean, humans have carried out primary, secondary stages for 10,000 or more years. So, I mean, for example, let me give you an example of miracle rice, the IR varieties, 8 or 64, have undergone thousands of mutations through breeding. This is genetic modification too. The maize cob, for example, has increased dramatically over thousands of years. The wild maize tough coating is now gone. Uh, now, for example, if you take the, uh, uh, take uh, Professor Burlog, you know, the Nobel laureate who got the Nobel Peace Prize for introducing the, the dwarf varieties. Now, uh, you know, he is responsible primarily for the dwarf, dwarf varieties or uh, rust resistance line. Now, had he done it through genetic modification of wheat, would you have opposed it? I'm so glad that you asked this question yes. because I think the viewers also need to understand sure. this very clearly. Yes. I'm a plant breeder myself yes. and I have been engaged in plant breeding when I was in, as a student. Right. Now let me tell you, there's a difference between plant breeding and there's a difference between transgenic. Mm -hmm. This is what we need to understand. Plant breeding, as you rightly said, over the hundreds of years has mm -hmm. evolved. There's no denying about it. What we do in plant breeding is we cross wheat with wheat. Yeah. We cross rice with rice. We cross barley with barley. But in case of transgenic, and I'm sure in nature, you have never got an example where you cross a donkey with a human being or, or, or a human being with a, with a rice plant. You know, in, in but the, it's a gene. It's not the whole donkey We need to DNA. understand. We need to understand. Yeah. You know, that is where, you know, the, the genetic engineering has actually broken that interspecies barrier. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to understand this and uh, so what is happening now is that you can cross uh, uh, at, at the genetic level at the molecular level uh, bring in genes from different kinds of alien species and insert in them now that is something different from the kind of breeding that was taken naturally so let's not confuse these two things of course let's so that chapter is, is separate when you say Borlaug evolved those varieties it took him number of years to, to cross those things and then we as a researcher I can tell you it takes number of years at least seven years for us to evolve a plant variety yeah, but over what the, what no. the, question, the question was, it had Burlog, uh, I mean in today's day and age, uh, and his views on genetic engineering are also very clear, you know, he was not an opponent, but had he evolved the, uh, the dwarf varieties using genetic engineering, would you have opposed they, they would, Yes, we would have definitely opposed, opposed it. Them. Yes, there was reason to oppose that. Now, what the Borlaug has done, has done through the natural process, mm -hmm. or what, as I said, is an evolution, a natural evolution that takes place. Nothing wrong in that. But when you try to bring in kind of these kind of species at, at a molecular level, and then to try to evolve a new uh, species or a new strain, whatever you call it, I think there are questions, a lot of questions attached with, with the kind of performance that it's going to get. Right. I mean, the, so the there's other, nothing the, wrong. The other that. issue with natural, uh, traditional breeding is that there is something called the linkage drag, which I'm sure you know, which is that when you're trying to breed, mix the two DNAs together, there's a lot of unwanted DNA that also jumps around. And you know, you have to subsequently make a lot of effort to remove the unwanted junk DNA. We have been in, doing it. As a researcher, I have been doing it myself. So there's nothing, uh, you know, uh, the, what the impression that has been given to us is as if we are trying to cut something. No, what happens is we have two plants. Two plants, when we cross them, we eventually get a variety, let's say out of the thousands of plants that we grow, which would be suitable to what, 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 uh, what actually I want uh, to really breed. So then we take time, it let, let it settle down. We take time to see, go, go on testing it again and again so that you know it settles down in that manner that uh, people can understand. And when it becomes a kind of a, a stable uh, variety, then only it is released. But, but in this particular- What you're saying is, I mean, you know, uh, let's, for example, if we we're talking about agriculture, uh -huh. and uh, surely you know, uh, you know, in the next 10 to 15 years, uh, through genetic engineering uh, is going to actually revolutionize medicine, the way we look at medicine, personalized medicine. We would also be looking at, there's a new technology that's you know, on the anvil called CRISPR technology, whereby you can actually do genetic engineering, you can actually, it's gene therapy. What you're saying is you, you, you know, as a blanket, uh, you're opposed to genetic engineering see, of in, organisms. See, in the case of medicine, let's be clear, yeah. you know, those cancer patients who are suffering, for instance, they need a kind of a dose which it bring, can bring them back into life or whatever, mm -hmm. you know. There's nothing wrong in that because you're only doing it at a level, micro level. But in this case of mass consumption, you know, why should we tamper with food when there is no need for it, is my question. You say that these varieties will revolutionize or increase yield. There is not even one single genetically modified crop in the world which increases crop productivity. So let me give you an example of, I mean, one of the first ones is the, uh, the papaya. You know, the papaya in the, back in the 80s, you would know, and you've written extensively about it, uh, you know, suffered, uh, uh, you know, it devastated the papaya crops in the 80s through this papaya ring spot virus. And the scientists produced a transgenic papaya where they took the uh, ineffectual part of a, a gene of this virus and introduced it in the papaya so that uh, you know, the papaya became immune to the virus. 
and it actually uh, it's basically like you would say uh, uh, you know what they did was is uh, HSB surface antigen vaccine. So what they take is, you know took as part of this this virus, and your body started making antibodies against the virus because you know the the the, the gene was expressing a protein of the virus. Now this has actually led to I, I would say a huge turnaround in papaya production and in profits and the ring spot virus has almost been eliminated and if I may call it this is what is growth economics. No, I don't agree with here. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, when right. you look at the papaya case specifically, of course, this is a country where, where they have allowed all kinds of genetically modification to take place. Mm -hmm. But all I want to suggest is, if you look at a country like India, you know, there are natural processes already available right. to take care of these diseases. Mm -hmm. Now, why we have to look at the profits? Economic growth only takes place when the profits of a company go up. So that is why we are more concerned about that. Why are you looking at the profits of a company to measure economic growth? Why can't you bring in any kind of a technology which is not uh, uh, dependent on some in intrusion that we have made, which is already prevalent, which is a way, pre which is already uh, 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 mechanism is available. Why don't you do, do that when the alternative uh, systems is available? Then to bring in the kind of a, a alien uh, kind of a technology. That's the question that we are trying to raise. Now, in the case of BT cotton, in the case of cotton, the, pro the bigger problem is the bollworm insect. Right. Now, let's be very clear. I just want to take a few minutes please, of yours to explain please. to this. Sure. Now, this is a kind of a check review uh, which has gone on over the decades. Now, when the cotton plant let's say about 50 years or 60 years back was affected by bollworm. Mm -hmm. At that time, there was no pink bollworm species at uh, such. We started with the first generation chemical. First generation chemicals like DDT and so on. Then when the insect became resistant to it, because there's a huge problem there in case of cotton, when we started with the second generation chemical. Then the insect became resistant to it after a couple of years. Then we started with the third generation chemical. I remember when the cypermethrins and these kinds of synthetic parathroids were introduced in Punjab and Haryana uh, way back in the 90s. Uh, I stood up and asked question, why are you bringing in the fourth generation chemicals to control these pests? You know, the industry was happy, the scientists were happy, this was an e easy way to take care of the problem. And look what happened then afterwards, the insect became resistant, first in Andhra Pradesh and then of course in various parts of the country. Now from that fourth generation thing, when and hundreds of people committed suicide because of the insect resistance, damaging the crop and of course damaging the economy. Now, subsequently what happens is we have moved away from that kind of a chakra view into now the biological chakra view. Now we have the first generation of BT first, the insect becomes resistant to BT1. Now the, we brought in Bolgar 2, which is a 2 gene. So now the insect becomes resistant to Bolgar 2 after a few years. Now we're going to bring in Bolgar 3, then we'll introduce a scorpion gene in, 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 um, in cotton to take care of this. Then we'll bring in a cobra gene. Is that the way science has to progress? But no, professor, let me, let do me you ask not realize that no. in antibiotics, for example, let, let me, you let have me penicillin. First, no, let me first answer this question. Sir, my, my submission here is that why can't we go in for that natural process of controlling the pest? Come to Jean in Haryana. Jean, there are 18 villages now where the women folk of those villages under the veil are trying to just walk around once in a week with a, with a magnifying glass trying to find out the kind of, a, uh, you know, the threshold of insects. And can you believe for last six, seven years, Jean farmers have not used any pesticide on cotton and yet there has been no attack of insects on on cotton. Now, is, is, is that something wrong that we need to follow? Is that not an economic growth model? Why can't we follow that economic growth model then be worrying about what the industry has to sell us? I think that's the point we are trying to make. Why do you want to pollute the environment? Why do you want to damage the human health also by spraying all those pesticides when there are simple you know, sustainable technologies already available? Just because the industry doesn't gain by it doesn't mean we should not take it. Right. So, uh, but uh, just to make it clear that you have the, uh, the GMBT cotton you don't have to spray the BT anymore, right? It's in no, the... no, it's in it. Yeah. But when you, the point I'm trying to make is BT is taking care of one particular uh, insect. But, but there are other insects in which you have a number, of, were saying, number of pesticides have to be sprayed. Otherwise, in, in any case, to control other pests. The point I'm trying to make is the pesticide use has gone up. In India also, it has gone up. If globally, it has gone up. So where is the gain? Where is the gain from, from BT uh, technology that it doesn't reduce the pesticide usage, it's only adding on to pesticide usage, there's no use. The point I'm trying to make is gene farmers can try to uh, have a kind of a crop in which there are no pesticides required, even no biological pesticides required. But haven't they shown, I mean, wrong? that PNA study I quoted for, from 46% uh, 
uh, the pesticide use has come down to 11%. This is very interesting. I would suggest you just go and Google, if you can, Google a Charles Ben Broker study of America. He's also a scientist, and he will tell you how phenomenally the pesticide use has gone up. That's what I'm saying. All these scientific bodies also need to be questioned, including the Royal Society. Royal Society is no exception. And uh, one of the Indians, I'm sure, is, is, is the chief now. I, I always question his science, because he comes to India and makes a science where we need genetically modified crops. I, don't, I think he doesn't even know what GM crops are. Because if there was one- a Professor Venki. Whosoever it is, the question is, the question is that if he knew that there's no GM crop in the world today which increases crop productivity, he wouldn't have said that. But he has been made to believe that there are, there are answers, which I think he should come and visit Punjab, come and visit other areas to see the farmers have given answers. Now look at Andhra Pradesh and Telangana, now they're split. Andhra Pradesh, 36 lakh acre, lakh acres, 36 lakh acre, no pesticide is sprayed, and there are 12, 15 crops grown in that area. And the productivity has not gone down, productivity is going up, the farmers are a happy lot, 42% drop in pesticide usage, the environment has become cleaner, the food security is now being ensured. In fact, the the Andhra chief minister has gone on record saying in the next three years he's going to make the entire farming class go non-chemical. Now that's the way forward. That's the way forward. But the industry will not support it. Simple reason because the growth economics doesn't take place. But so what you mean to say is that if you do not use any pesticides, you're not following the growth economics? Is that what you're saying? See, let's be very clear. When I was a student of agriculture, but if agriculture, the productivity has gone up, let me explain that. When when they when I was a student of agriculture, there was a paper published by David Pimentel of the Cornell University, and David Pimentel had said, very distinguished scientist, he had said that 99% pesticides that you spray go into environment. Only less than 1% pesticide hits the target pest. Now, we knew it all along that only 1% pesticides are going to hit the target pest. The rest all are going into environment, in fact, which I is want damaging. To quote, it's very interesting you've quoted, uh, you know, I want to quote a study, which was a, a landmark study by Bruce Amis in 19, uh, I think 1992, uh, again in uh, PNA's paper. Uh, what he actually did extensively, studied extensively, and he found out that the dietary pesticides in American, in American diet, American food, 99.99% are all natural pesticides. So it is a misnomer to say that synthetic pesticides are the ones that are producing, are polluting the American dietary, uh, you know, foods. No, see, the, what Bruce Emmis said, I think, has been questioned a number of times. I'm not getting into that because I'm not an uh, expert on that issue. Mm -hmm. But let me tell you what he says the other way. I'm saying when you spray pesticides, chemical pesticides, pesticides from outside, they were not required. When I quote David Pimentel, all I'm saying is David Pimentel had said that only less than 1% pesticides would hit the target pest, which means 99% pesticides were going into environment in any case. So when we try to tell the country that you know so much of pesticides are being used, we are not telling the country that so much is going into environment or going into human health or impacting human health. Now, if only 1% were hitting the target pest, shouldn't we have gone into a kind of a system where we didn't require pesticide? Now, what Andhra has shown today, or Telangana now because they are split, Andhra has shown today is a model of agriculture which is called non-pesticide management. They don't use pesticide at all. Now please tell me, who, who will have objection if no pesticides are used and yet the crops are bountiful? Will anybody have objection? Then why, isn't that growth economics? Or growth economics is always related to that we must see the benefits or the advantages or the stocks market of these companies. I think that is what I'm trying to drive at or focus at, that that is not growth economics. This is the real economics that we should be focusing on. Right. Now, uh, I mean, in your opposition to GM crops, you've teamed up with another uh, uh, scientist, I think filmmaker Mahesh Bhatt. You actually agreed with him when he said uh, uh, GM technology is bioterrorism. And now what he said is that in 1989, uh, Around 10,000 people were disabled after L-tryptophan, a genetically modified drug, was introduced in America. Most suffered memory loss, muscle weaknesses, leathery skin, and other symptoms. Studies attribute around 100 deaths to the epidemic. So in fact, what scientist Mahesh Bhatt was saying was actually wrong because L-tryptophan is, is not a genetically modified drug. It's a naturally occurring amino acid. And uh, you know, there was a batch, defective batch from a Japanese company uh, which was exporting this L-tryptophan to America. And that is what caused the thing. So you see, Professor, what I'm trying to say, that there are two issues here. One is that uh, uh, you know, in manufac uh, manufacturing defect has been interlinked with uh, an opposition to GMO, where this is not GMO at all. 
would you like to comment on you know these, these issues that so get there are two things i want to clarify here yeah. first of all when we requested mahesh bhatji to do this documentary right. i must tell you we spent a lot of time to first convince him right. and once he got convinced he did his own research asked ajay kanchan the director to do research and that research part was done by them i had no involvement there and i think they did a remarkable job in that but now the 10, l tryptophan now the l tryptophan controversy that you talk about yeah. is basically their research but the, what i remember so far is L tryptophan of course we know is a amino acid but was genetically modified and that was sold as uh, whatever name you call it but 37 people roughly if i remember vaguely had died because of it and hundreds of people were affected now that's what uh, mahesh bhat is if he is quoting those studies he's quoting from that particular aspect now this this particular thing was genetically modified it was of course a very serious issue and that was the first uh, i would say a, a kind of a, a disaster that took place subsequently we have seen over the years that you know these uh, as far as these uh, drugs are concerned we not gone into it but when i say we have looked into the mass consumption thing which is food that is where the concerns arise which mahesh bhat did brilliantly to to raise those issues in that documentary the documentary was screened in front of monsanto also let me make it very clear and the documentary was also screened in the parliament now that documentary is one documentary which i think has uh, been able to uh, be a very important tool in the hands of activists who were trying to really raise concern over the bt brinjal no, exactly in fact i want to come to that because the next question concerns because the documentary of mahesh bhat and which you know you link to as well was talking about the bt brinjal now bt brinjal has had a very tortuous history mm -hmm. in america in in india rather because it's been developed by an indian company in association with monsanto marco seed corporation uh, and uh, jairam ramesh in 2009 i think it was that he said we need more politic as uh, uh, so long as we don't have a political and a scientific consensus we should not uh, uh, you know release bt brinjal now bt brinjal uh, for example is like bt cotton except that it is to be consumed and uh, the bt gene is actually cry 1ac gene which has uh, been incorporated into the brinjal uh, the fruit uh, now the, the whole point is that uh, you referred to uh, you know in your opposition to bt brinjal you actually referred to Uh, Professor Schubert, what he says, which is that the BT toxin in GM crops is 1,000 times more concentrated than in BT sprays, and in fact, this 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 part of this quote of Professor Schubert was taken by the Greenpeace when they approached the Supreme Court, and in their petition against BT Brinjal, they have quoted this. Uh, but strangely, what they have not quoted, and what you also have not quoted, is that uh, the Greenpeace internal research actually belies these claims because what they found in 2002 and then again in 2006. was that uh, the bt corn in germany and spain uh, the plants are actually producing much less uh, bt toxin than bt sprays itself now it's uh, now the, when the the uh, the bt uh, the green peas actually talk about in their suit um, uh, against uh, uh, the green peas is talk about in, in the court case uh, it's a uh, it's an amazing u turn what they've done so initially what they were saying is that it should not be allowed because there is too much toxin produced and what they're now saying is that look at spain look at germany uh, bt should not be allowed because there is too less uh, bt toxin produced so it is ineffective well so, I, i again i would say so that it's like this, a, this particular case of case, I mean, no no this particular case of the court case that uh, you referred to about uh, green peas mm -hmm. is uh, not in my immediate understanding but all i can say is one thing that when we see these technologies when we when we talking about bt brinjal for instance primarily what you are talking about right. is that you you must bring in this kind of a technology into india and there was so much of uh, hangama saying that you know the crop is getting affected by the kind of insects that you know feed on it and so on which you referred to earlier now my question to you anand is again one Uh, in the last 10 years this was uh, this was uh, the moratorium came in 2010 right. let me tell you after the we have 6 years now in these 6 years did you hear of any problem in bt Brin uh, in brinjal the the point is we these scientific bodies try to give an impression as if you know the farmers are dying because of the bt brinjal thing because of the because of brinjal getting affected by this particular insect the farmers are suffering because they are not getting the right price for the brinjal crop that's the bigger issue in this country whereas we are trying to divert attention to a to a issue which is which is non existent or which can be taken care of as i said of alternate or natural means that's the point we were trying to impress in our uh, in mahesh bhat's documentary as well as in our campaigns also no, in fact Now, William Staten, just to add to that, what you're saying is very important point you're making. 
uh, is that um, in 1999, the lawsuit, the, the Greenpeace again, they said BT crops are dangerous because the toxins are not readily degraded in the environment. Mm -hmm. And this is a point that you know many people have, Vandana Shiva has made, I think you've also probably made, that the degradation of the BT toxin is an issue for them. But uh, in a 2006 petition uh, to block the BT crops in New Zealand, Greenpeace says that BT cotton is ineffective because the BT protein is degraded and linked to heat stress. So yet again, I mean, in the first instance, what they're saying is that there is too much production of BT toxin, so it's harmful. Then they find out themselves that there is too less production, so what they're saying, well, it's useless. Now, in the second case, they say that uh, it is not degraded very well in the environment, so it's harmful. And then they say, well, it's degraded too fast, so the, the GM food is useless because yeah. it doesn't have. So you oh. see what I'm trying to say? I mean, you know, you have it, you make an argument, and then you, the scientists they, themselves, they discover that, look, this argument is not valid anymore, but then you use that and come back to it. And let, let me, I would like your opinion on the point that India, of course, you do not, you have a moratorium on the GM uh, yeah. ringel, but Bangladesh, there isn't. They have started, in fact, 2015, they're having fields of BT brinjal. So would you say Bangladesh has acted erroneously or is it that India has taken the wise decision? I would L like your comments on that. L let me first take you to your sure. earlier, earlier question. You know, this part that, you know, many times what you say is that uh, they, they kind of, even you know, in arguing in court, this is what happens. But you'll, I can give you a number of examples where the multinational companies have tried to really hide the facts uh, which, were, which they were actually, the courts made them come out with those facts. And then it was found that uh, what the uh, activists were saying was were true. So this is not the only the case where you are trying to find fault with Greenpeace. The point I'm trying to make is multinational companies are also responsible for doing it. They have been burying data. They have been trying to penalize people who have been questioning this. The Arpad Pusjai case is very well known. He was not an activist. He was a scientist who stumbled upon this outcome that, you know, when the rats develop ulcers, when you develop, when you eat a GM potato, and look at the hue and cry. I happen to be at that time in England, and I know no scientific, uh, uh, no scientist had the courage to stand up and accept that result. Why? Then you find everything faulty with the research. Look at the monarch butterfly case in America. The monarch butterfly case, now then the scientists said that they, these, uh, the, the, these, the methodology was not correct. Very interesting. Thank God it was not done in India. India, they would have said you don't even know how to do science. In America, they said the methodology was not correct. Anytime you question the science or the technology, every time there's something wrong with the methodology. But every time you find the technology wonderful, then nobody questions the methodology. Now, the, now, the point I'm trying to make yeah. is, sir, if, the, if you've seen a report which Indian, the Coalition for GM Free India has published, it has published a document carrying 400 scientific studies questioning the technology. Now the point I want to know, understand is, why is the scientific body not taking notice of it, including the Nobel laureates? They say everything is fine. Your own scientific research is showing uh, or asking questions. Why shouldn't you first try to answer those questions is what we are trying to say. We are not against science per se, but we are saying, you know, we cannot cover up or provide a cover up to the, to the negative that are quite visible uh, and done by those scientists themselves. That's the question that we are trying to raise. There have been a number of cases of uh, peas, for instance, going wrong in, in, in Australia or in Austria and so on and so forth, which are, which are evident uh, evidences before us that this is how the technology can fail. Now, the point is, in the case of uh, Brinjal now, I come to a second point. Yes. About we, Bangladesh. You, we were able to stall it. Now, that is what we were discussing earlier. If you remember your first question, when I questioned the, the way scientists were trying to propagate technology, is uh, that's the point I'm trying to make. They are subservient to the, to the private interests. Now, in India, you, we think we don't know what is the kind of a public uh, interest that is being scuttled by the private companies. We all know that. Now, similarly, in, in Bangladesh, perhaps they, the civil society was not at as vos, vociferous in stopping uh, the unwanted use of uh, uh, brinjal uh, in, in Bangladesh. In Philippines also this is happening. Philippines, of course, the courts have struck it down. In, in Bangladesh, people were not as powerful, uh, people were not as aware as in India. Now, in India, we were very aware. We did a lot of time, we spent a lot of time with people to get them understand this. Uh, Professor, I'm sorry, we're really running out of time, so I'll probably have just a couple of minutes to answer. Um, it's been very illuminating to talk. So let me come back to, uh, you know, the, uh, the glyphosate hmm. issue, which is what you talked about, and you mentioned a professor, the group, Seralini. Now, in fact, it's strange that you, and you've written about Seralini group as well. Uh, in fact, uh, you do not, or neither Greenpeace mentioned that Greenpeace has actually funded the group previously. And uh, the, the claim of the Seralini group that GM maize causes hepatotoxic effects, they were investigated by the European Food and Safety Authority, found to be false. 
In 2012, the same group published a paper titled Long-Term Toxicity of a Roundup Herbicide, Herbicide and Roundup Tolerant Genetically Modified Maize. Uh, again, uh, two years and tens of peers complained later. The journal took the unprecedented step of retracting the study. This is what you were talking about. Okay, what it said, the journal said was, a more in-depth look at raw data is necessary. It revealed no definitive conclusions uh, with the small sample size regarding the role of either NK603 or glyphosate in regards to overall mortality or tumor incidence. Now again, uh, the same Seralini group reported that GM maize varieties induce a state of uh, hepatorenal, hepatorenal toxicity. Again, yet again, uh, the European uh, Food and Safety Organ was forced to reconvene and look into the matter. It concluded, and I quote, the author's claims regarding new side effects indicating kidney and liver toxicity are not supported by the data provided in the paper. The experts were of the unequivocal view that there were no indications of adverse effects of human, animal, and health environment. And this goes on and on. For example, there has been Dr. Uh, Jayasumina from Sri Lanka, who's talked about that glyphosate use actually causes kidney effects. And people have shown the paper in science uh, and nature. They have shown that this is actually not true. Uh, it is, uh, the reason is actually heat and uh, uh, the, the, the conversion of glucose to fructose and fructokinase. So, what I'm trying to say is that, do you not uh, see the overwhelming evidence that is brought about by an intrinsic ability in science to self-correct? I mean, it is not that scientists would take a, a result at face value, which is what you were mentioning initially, that it is not for anyone, let alone scientists, to take any, any result at a face value. But when you have peer-reviewed uh, 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 you know, acceptance of a result, do you not think that lends credibility no, it's, to... It's, it's very interesting. That's yeah. where I think it's very fundamental to the kind of I'm discussion sorry, it's a genuine having. question that I'm asking. No, no, you're, I'm not questioning your, uh, your, your question, basically. All I'm trying to explain is, let's be very clear, you have used many technical terms, which I think, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't have to answer them, because what you're trying to say is that these were the kinds of uh, questions that were addressed by these particular studies. Now, the question here is one, sir, that, you know, all those studies, including Sirarani studies, it was also peer-reviewed. Now, one peer review is bad, one peer review is good. So we should also question the way peer reviews are done, A. Peer reviewed study published in a journal. The journal then it was refuted, it was retracted because there was Monsanto man joining it. You did not mention this. The, okay. the other part is when the same study goes into another journal, it is accepted. Then it, he was taken to court also. This man, uh, Sri Alani, was taken to court. Court has also absolved him now but of Professor, all those things. The, now, hold on. The World hold Health on. Organization, hold the on. Let me. Medical Association. No, World Health Organization. Of Sciences, yes, that's what we are. Association of the Advancement of Science have all declared there is no, and I quote, there is no good evidence GMOs are unsafe. That's what the question is, sir, that, you know, in this, all these bodies, that's what I've been saying, challenging from very beginning, are so under the influence of these private interests that- World Health Organization? Yes, also. No, World Health Organization is a very classical case. You know, it took them so many years to realize that cigarette smoking is harmful. How many decades it took them to realize? And now it, we know there's a study done that sugar is harmful. They haven't yet released that study. Can we ask WHO why they haven't done that? This is a study, monumental study done, which says sugar is harmful. They haven't released that study because they know it's sugar in industrial interest will be hit by that. So let's not go by what these international bodies do. The point I'm trying to make is if science is so good, then why are they always questioning when, they, when people like Arpit Pujai ask a question, when people like, you know, you talked about the glyphosate example in, uh, in Argentina, there have been massive, massive implications on the kidney, on the human health aspects. There are a number of studies which say that, but we try to just brush them aside, bring one national body to say that this is all okay. The point I'm trying to make, sir, today, let me be very clear, last if, it, if you're saying the time is short, sure. I must make One it very clear that organic food is now a booming, a booming craze in America. Today, their uh, companies are now paying farmers in advance, also paying in transition fees so that they can produce organic food. People are realizing that all the genetically modified food, all the chemically modified produce has been harmful for their health, harmful for the environment. I think people are more sensible, and I think the scientists also need to look into why people are now beginning to question and stand up. I think that's a more important question, and I think we m cannot decry scientific studies which question the science, the, the dominant science to, to say per se. That's now, the question I yeah, place. just the last couple of issues. One, I would, you know, I'm sorry because of the time I haven't talked about your 10-point program, so I'll briefly touch upon that. But before that, I want to come to the golden rice, which uh, the Nobel laureates the the, the, in the letter they mentioned. And Vandana Shiva has been a vociferous uh, opponent of golden rice, and so have you been. 
so in fact, uh, I have written a disclosure. I have written a piece on uh, the golden rice and Dr. Vandana Shiva's uh, opposition to it. In fact, she gets all the figures wrong, but that is immaterial. But I just I, on the, the major point is that what they're doing is that you have three beta carotene biosynthesis genes. They've put it in the rice. And beta carotene, as you know, is a precursor to vitamin A. Now, the World Health Organization says 250 million people suffer from vitamin A deficiency, including 40% of children under five in the developing world. Uh, VAD itself is the leading cause of childhood blindness globally, affecting 250,000 to 500 children each year. Half die within 12 months of yeah. losing their eyesight. Yeah. Uh, Nobel laureate uh, Richard Roberts, who uh, discovered introns, which is a fundamental concept in the dogma of life, he says GM food is essential to address malnourishment issue. We could do wonders to our food supply with GMOs. If you don't want to eat GMOs, then don't. But don't pretend they are dangerous. They are not. They're probably safer than traditional foods. And he's claimed more than 15 million children had died or suffered globally due to vitamin A deficiencies. So what is your opposition? This is, if sheer, we have this is sheer propaganda. Let me tell why, you. Uh, this is, the I discoverer have, of introns. I have, I have, this is sheer propaganda. Let me tell you why. I have also been debating with the gentleman who bred the uh, variety golden rice. Okay, And I know what he's trying to say. The point is very clear, sir. The genetically modified rice or the golden rice has not been uh, is not been uh, opposed or uh, sorry not been actually stopped because of any uh, activist uh, uh, this thing uh, so far opposition so far it is still not passed the regulatory test mechanism you know a professor G Glenn Stone of Washington University has done an ample peer reviewed study who has shown clearly that it is still to pass the regulatory stages so let's not get into that be the other part that you know this the as if you know uh, great loss is being done somebody said you know I have been part of committees where they say you know look at Africa the people are they, they, uh, I remember a picture they showed me a, ch a child carrying a bowl saying I need GM on the other hand he carried a placard saying I need GM food because he was hungry my argument to that was you could have given him another pot or a bottle saying I'm also thirsty and shown a coca-cola bottle with that that's not the way I think this is this is what they, these scientists are trying to do a kind of create a, a, in a picture as if you know the people who are opposed these technologies are the ones who are responsible for hunger. Let me tell you, today we don't need this technology to address hunger. What we need to address hunger, as I said earlier in the very beginning of this uh, discussion we have, is we need to address this issue of access and distribution. A, we produce food for already double the population. If these people were being fed the kind of food they need, there would have been no deficiency of, gold, uh, of vitamin A in, in this population. So that is where we need to attack, not on providing these kinds of uh, scientific uh, quick fix as the answer. So Professor, just the final minute and final question, if I may. Uh, you know, this, actually this is linked to your plan for the Indian agriculture, and I'll harp on that. Uh, but before that, briefly you talked about you're a good proponent of organic farming. Now, it has been shown, scientifically shown, in fact, there's a paper in Nature that organic farming provides up to 34% lower yields than conventional farming, and you would require an additional 3 billion hectares of land if you want to feed the world through organic farming. You know, it's very interesting. We quote studies which are suitable to our interests. Let me tell you, there was a study done by 400 scientists across the globe. It was sponsored by World Bank and the United Nations. It is called IAASTD, International Assessment for Agriculture, Sustainable Technology and Development, something like that, IAASTD. It has shown very conclusively that business as usual is not the way forward. We have to move to non-chemical agriculture. And there are ample examples all over the world where it has been shown that there is no drop in the yield. Now, please tell me which is right, which is wrong. Now, here is a scientific body is to, uh, which is backed by World Bank and the United Nation which has established this. So uh, please, professor, let's not, paper let's in not, nature. no, so paper in nature, why can't you question that? I have questioned papers in science also. The science journal also have been publishing, uh, you know, many reports which are, which are just benefiting the industry. They haven't taken the uh, arguments, I have responded, tried to respond to them, they don't take it. So the point is, you know, they, 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 this is very, very, very easily done. Now, no, I'm saying is this is a UN and the World Bank sponsored study, which is done by international team of scientists, 400 scientists. Now, what do you want me to add on to it if the 400 scientists are wrong? That's the point I'm trying to make. So there is ample evidence, A. The second part is we have seen across the globe, even in India, that you know the damages that has been done uh, to the environment from agriculture. Now, your question is basically that the kind of agriculture that we need to do. Today, 41% gas emissions are from agriculture, including livestock. 
Now this is where we need to change agriculture. We don't need adapting technology. We, the, one, the entire effort today is to adapt farmers to, to adapt to the conditions uh, you know, that are going to emerge. But my argument is why can't we change that model of agriculture which is going to add on to, which is adding on to that crisis, which is leasing the greenhouse gases. We can do that. Why can't we do that? You know, I'm sure if the Andhra Pradesh study has been uh, evaluated in terms of how much greenhouse gas emissions it reduces, we'll have the data. So I think we need to have that kind of studies done to ensure that you know, the future becomes uh, sustainable. But let me at the end tell you one thing, that when I opposed the genetically modified groups at, uh, crops at the first World Food and Farming Congress, where I was invited to speak in the very first inaugural session, you, I must share with you the industry backlash to me, just like the troll uh, we have on the Twitter, was one of the scientists second day stood up and said that, you know, uh, Devinder Sharma is part of Al-Qaeda. He was asked to step it's back part of Al-Qaeda. And he was asked to step back uh, by, the, uh, by the audience, somebody in the audience saying that this is not done. We invited him to, to, to come and talk to us. And if he doesn't uh, uh, you know, gel with what we are saying, doesn't mean he becomes part of uh, Al-Qaeda. So the industry can go to that extent also to see that uh, you know, people who question the, the dominant science are the ones who are bracketed in that category. Right. Just final question, Professor, before we wind up. I'm sorry we've taken uh, much more time than we should have. Um, uh, here I uh, come to the, the, your plan for uh, Indian agriculture. And in fact, I don't have time to go into the, the 10 points that you make, but uh, I'll probably just uh, a couple of points that you say that importing food is importing unemployment. And tied to that, what you say is providing a guaranteed, assured monthly income to farmer. Now, Professor, that 47 percent of Indians are employed in agriculture. It would be devastating economically to provide them an assured monthly income. Wouldn't insurance be better? So should we let them die? The question that I think needs to be asked is, the, if there are f roughly 50 percent of people are engaged in agriculture, so should we allow them to uh, you know, be dependent upon or pray to God that they, that they should not be uh, kept alive or whatever? The question here is, this is where I said the economics is faulty. This is what I'm trying to so say. My, my question was I, I'm coming assured to salary versus insurance. I, I'm just coming to that. Yeah. Insurance is no answer. Let's be very clear. Insurance, if, if insurance is the answer for their salaries, why do we have to give seventh pay commission? Why don't we allow insurance to come and uh, take care of their, uh, their uh, incomes? You know, very cleverly, we try to s help one section of society with, with the kind of help we want to give them, and the other, we ignore them and then give them all these kinds of sermons that, you know, insurance is going to take care of you. I think the only way forward, if you sabka saath, sabka vikas, is to provide farmers with a gun guaranteed income. The, all, all I'm saying is that Chaprasi can get 18,000 rupees. Economics, but Professor, have you calculated the economics of it, about uh, you know, having an assured salary for the farmers that you say? This is the, the, the fundamental question. Let's, make, let's be very clear about it. Ki, for, for the farmers, we think insurance is the way forward. For, this, for the government employees, why don't we suggest insurance as the way forward? We are willing to provide them ample kind of a pay increases through the seventh pay commission. Nobody is saying that uh, you, know, you should have uh, the insurance taking care of their income. A. Secondly, if you look at uh, the last 12 years, 48 lakh crore is the tax exemption given to the corporates. On top of it, we also know that stressed uh, bank uh, amount is roughly 20 lakh crore. Stressed. The one which has been, uh, you know, uh, uh, which is under the uh, uh, cut zone is about 7 lakh crore. But 20 lakh crore is still there, uh, affected. And now the point I'm trying to make is with 48 lakh crore, with another 20 lakh crore, which will perhaps be, uh, again, uh, we have to take care of it. Why is it that we can't pay a fraction of it to the farmers? If that fraction had gone to the farmers, that's what I've been saying, we need a guaranteed income. The price policy has to be replaced by income policy now. Farmers too need income. Globally, it has been accepted that the era of price policy is over. Over. We should replace it by providing farmers a direct income support, and that is the way forward. We can't just push them into C just because we feel that the corporate sector or the industrial sector would be hit because the raw material cost will go up or the cheaper labor will become difficult. I think that's not the way forward. The way forward is to strengthen agriculture, provide them incomes, provide, and that is what Prime Minister Modi perhaps needs to know, understand, sabka saath, sabka vikas. Just final question, uh, Professor. As you know, in fact, you mentioned it that um, the world population in 2050 would be 9 billion people. Uh, the food production has to increase by a whopping 70% over the current levels. Do you think 
one can achieve that in 2050. I don't agree with this. Over. I don't agree with this uh, statistics. You don't agree with that assessment? I don't agree. See, if you look at the uh, report of the International Agriculture Assessment, uh, IAASTD, it says very clearly the average of calorie requirement today is about 2,600 or 2,400 yes. calories. Mm -hmm. What the world produces today is 4,600 calories. There is no shortage of food in the world. As I said, the population today is about 7.2 billion. We produce food for 13.5 billion. We are being misled to believe that in 2050, the, the, uh, we will be unable to feed the world. All that we need to do is to ensure that we reduce food wastages. 50% of it goes waste. And if we were to save that food wastage, we would have food left for even the, or we would meet the requirement of food even in the next century, let me tell you. We have no such problem. This, this just being a halla is being created by the industry because they have to sell their products. They have to sell their, this input provider industry who stands to gain. And that is what is actually linked to economic growth. Thank you very much, Professor. It was an absolute pleasure having you on News Laundry. Thank you very much. Uh, that brings to a close our interview with uh, Professor Devendra Sharma. Remember when the corporations pay, the corporations are served. When the public pays, the public is served. Support News Laundry, support independent media. Thank you very much. If you enjoyed that, click up here to support us and down here to subscribe. Be sure to check out our older episodes and the other stuff we do like Can You Take It, I Agree, panel discussions, comics and animations and much, much more.